Hey everybody, episode 45 is here at last. We've got two months, May and June 1989, and 15 games. So what do we have today? A Nintendo Adventure game, a Capcom RPG, and an SNK sports game, and the first game from the guys who later made Pokemon, and a huge hit from Konami that is really not that great. Sorry. But the highlight is a look at a Tengen game, and the horrible convoluted licensing shenanigans that occurred when trying to bring that game to the consoles. So let's get started. Oh man. Hell of a way to start a new episode with a Toa Chiki game. And it's a sequel, May Tante Holmes, M. Kara no Chosinjo. Toa Chiki is probably most well known for a week of Garfield, which we just saw last Crontendo. And Toa Chiki is not very prolific, so it's kind of strange seeing two games released almost back to back. This is the third, and last, May Tante Holmes game. The first was from way back in 1986 and was completely different. It was more of an action adventure game. That was the one where you walked around various towns in England and people were shot at you for no reason. The sequel, Kira no London's at Susan Jinkin, was a standard Portopia-style adventure game. Now, M. Kira no Chosenjo is a bit better looking than either of the other two. Holmes no longer has green hair, the artwork is much less ugly, and the music is mostly 8-bit renditions of various classical pieces. It was developed by another, who did the previous Torchiki Holmes game, as well as Hot Bee's Black Bass games, and Hoshi no Mirohidu, that astonishingly terrible and buggy RPG which came in at the number 2 spot in the Crontendo list of worst Famicom games. Now, this is not a really interesting or original game, though it does swipe something from much better adventure games, namely the prologue sequence that leads into the title screen. I believe that actually Enix started this trend with some of their earlier adventure games. This guy looks like Principal Skinner from The Simpsons. One thing about this game is that it's very heavy on dialogue. You spend most of the game talking to people, which is typical for this sort of game, but for fans of Western adventure games, it might seem pretty repetitive just hitting like, the ask button over and over and over again. There's very little action. Well, it does break up the monotony by throwing in this little maze sequence set in Paris. But there's really nothing here that makes it sort of stand out from the crowd of the many, many adventure games we've seen so far. Alright, out of the frying pan and into the fire. What's this next game about? Well, think, what is the least exciting genre of video game? Probably the stock market simulation game. This is weird music. That's not really the soundtrack to making a lot of money, in my opinion. From Hector, we have the wonderfully titled Kabushiki Dojo, or Stock Market Dojo. You know, dojo like a karate dojo. And this is your stock market master. Obviously, this game doesn't take itself too seriously. The graphics, by the way, are done by Tosa. You start by choosing how much money you have. Let's go big. I feel really lucky today. That is some tall cash. I love the way this guy just whips out these three-foot-tall stacks of money. I mean, how do you even transport that much cash? So you pick your stock here. You then get a little chart showing the stock's performance. This lady with the skinny legs will then take your money. And what is she standing in front of? That's supposed to be some sort of computer? Alright, now let's see what kind of profit we are making. Ah, good. Let's keep going. Hmm. Well, that's not so good. So this is just sort of what you do over and over again. Uh, if you do really badly, this guy will hop in and get mad at you. 
And honestly, I can give you no tips about how to play this game. If I knew how to make a fortune in the stock market, I would be recording this from a beach in Bermuda somewhere. If you make enough money, you win the game and get to marry the girl. But I'm afraid it's up to you guys to figure this one out. Okay, here's one that everybody remembers, though not necessarily in a good way. Released on May 12th by Konami, Gekikami Ninja Den, though we know it as Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Released in the US in June under Konami's Ultra Games label. As we know, Konami tended to alternate between top-down exploration-based games like King Kong 2 and Metal Gear, and these side-scrolling action games, like Contra or Russian Attack. Sometimes Konami combines the two into one game, like Getsufu Maden or this one right here. Each level involves you roaming around on the overworld and entering various side-scrolling areas. In this way, it does actually resemble Getsufu Maden quite a bit. Now, I assume most of you out there have some familiarity with the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, they begin life as a comic book, which just happened to come out at exactly the right time. Now, for those of you who are not children of the 80s, I will offer up this little digression. In the 60s and 70s, there were mostly two types of comics in the US. Mainstream comics from large, well-distributed companies, and underground comics, which were normally in black and white and contained lots of uh, sex and drugs and violence. Towards the late 70s, the traditional underground comics begin dying out, and a wave of newer alternate comics begin emerging, often with science fiction or fantasy themes. The early 80s also saw an explosion of more serious independent comics. The alternate comic scene just completely exploded in popularity at this time, and dozens and dozens of small black and white comics appeared. One such comic, which was self-published by Kevin Eastman and Peter Lard, was 1984's Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Now, anyone who read comics at the time would recognize the title as referencing some of the biggest trends in mainstream comics at that time, namely mutants, teenagers, and ninjas, as seen in the best-selling comics of the time, The Uncanny X-Men and The Teen Titans, as well as the immensely popular titles from Frank Miller. The first issue of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles is mostly inspired by Frank Miller's Ronin comic, I wouldn't really call the Turtles a parody of these comics, it was more of like a goofy piss take in which the fact that the heroes are turtles undermines the gritty, supposedly mature qualities of Miller's comics. Now the comic was a huge and unexpected success, and was very quickly reprinted several times. As far as I know, it seemed to ignite the trend of comics selling for many times their original cover price within months of being released. It bolstered the wave of emergent funny animal comics in the 80s, and of course inspired numerous direct rip-off spoofs and so on. Eastman and Lard followed it up with more issues of the comic, and then in 1987 signed a deal with Playmates to release a series of turtle toys, which became insanely popular. Simultaneously, the rights to the turtles were licensed to an Irish animation studio, and the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles cartoon debuted in October 1988. Now by this time, the tone of the comic had changed quite a bit, and then the animated cartoon lightened it even further, and the, our heroes were given a California surfer dude makeover, and made to say such things as Cowabunga, despite New York City not really being a surfing hotspot. For a while, the turtles were a phenomenon on par with the NES itself, with tons of toys, Serial, movies, and of course, this right here. Konami released two turtle games in 1989, the one we're checking out today, and an arcade game, which is, perhaps, slightly better regarded than the console game. It was actually the first in a series of excellent multiplayer arcade beat-em-ups from Konami, and would eventually get Nintendo Entertainment System version as well. For the time being, however, we are stuck with this, the first Ninja Turtle game. It's not a bad looking game, the music is really good, 
and it sold like hotcakes. It's just now considered to be a much lesser game than the other Turtles games. One cool feature is the ability to swap out characters at any time. Donatello with his staff has far and away the most attacking power as well as the longest reach. He's the most valuable turtle, so it's best to save him for bosses or otherwise difficult situations. Now, one criticism of this game is it doesn't really seem to be based on the cartoon series. The enemies are, for the most part, not taken from the series with the exception of a few of the bosses. Like this dude. What's he supposed to be? A chainsaw-wielding dude in purple pants? What does it mean? Even the manual can't be bothered to tell you who these guys are, though it does somehow manage to squeeze in a reference to the Blake Edwards movie, Tin. Though in all fairness to Konami, development on this game would have begun well before the cartoon actually debuted. Here is the second boss fight, Bebop, or is it Rocksteady? I can't remember. I'm using the cheap method on this guy. I wonder if when Michael Bay makes his remake he'll change his name to Crunkcore or something. But of course, the thing that everyone remembers is the Hudson River stage. Shredder has planted bombs in the river to blow up the dam. The dam? What dam is that? Oh, you know, the big dam on the Hudson River right near Manhattan? Surely you've noticed that dam before? According to the manual, it's right near the Holland Tunnel. Now, as far as video game water levels go, this one is somewhat annoying. You have these electric uh, barriers, as well as a killer kelp, and a time limit to work with. And your turtles aren't really that easy to control while swimming, so it's pretty easy to hit the kelp and take damage. Still, it's not really that bad, and the game does get much harder near the end. See, I made it, just barely. After this, we get a cutscene. Young people today, I assume, would see this and wonder, what are those things on the right side of the TV? This level is called Wall Street for some reason, despite the fact this doesn't resemble Wall Street whatsoever. And why is there a river running through Manhattan? Oh, I get it. That must be Canal Street. These levels are pretty non-linear, and many of the areas you don't need to enter at all. You can skip quite a few of them. But there are some valuable uh, things to be found, like the pizza, which will completely refill your health. And they reappear when you exit and re-enter, so you can max out everybody's health bar here. Your health bar does not refill between levels, so any pizza you find is quite valuable. Also, if one of your turtles had lost all his health and becomes captured, you can actually rescue him in one of the sewers here. And you need to find some missiles and some rope. I don't know why rope is so hard to find in Manhattan. The boss here is another turtle who turns out to be a robot. I like the way Splinter slowly floats to the ground after you free him. And this really isn't a bad game, it's just not very inspired. It doesn't seem to have to do much, you know, with the actual Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Honestly, you could change the character's sprites here, and you'd have no way of knowing this was supposed to be a Ninja Turtles game. I'm sure that it has its defenders, but really, if you were going to sit down and play a Ninja Turtle game, would you choose this one? Would you really? I somehow don't think you would. At this point, Capcom hasn't really produced a whole lot of great games for the Famicom. Oh sure, we've had the two Mega Man games and Bionic Commando, but other than that there was, um, well I guess Commando, maybe Legendary Wings? Well, here's a little known cult classic. Tenji Okurao, or Eating the Heavens and Earth. Eating metaphorically, I guess. In the US we call this Destiny of an Emperor. Not a very appropriate title, as we'll see. 
so you don't normally associate Capcom with RPGs. In the Super Nintendo era, they had come out with that one series, uh, Dragon Breath, or I guess actually uh, Breath of Fire. But when you think of Capcom, you think of action platformers or fighting games, but not normally RPGs. Now, Dragon Quest was really popular in Japan at this time, and so were military simulation games, which had a number of historical themes. So I guess Capcom just decided to kill two birds with one stone and came out with this. What we have here is a Dragon Quest clone set in ancient China. In fact, it's based on the Romance of the Three Kingdoms, the Chinese historical novel that we've already seen a few games based on, like Koei's Romance of the Three Kingdoms. So this is based on that famous novel from medieval China, which tells a highly fictionalized version of the events of the Three Kingdoms era of China, which takes place in around 180 to 200 AD. The opening cut scene shows the three main heroes. There's the main dude, Liu Bei, the big tough guy, Guan Yu, and the fiery-tempered Zhang Fei. They are swearing an oath of allegiance in the Peach Garden. Guan Yu, aka Guan Gong, the guy with the uh, red face and the big beard, and Zhang Fei are very common figures in Chinese art, Chinese opera, and so on. You've undoubtedly seen these guys somewhere before. A lot of Chinese businesses have statues of Guan Yu because he symbolizes honesty. So obviously Capcom emulated the look and feel of Dragon Quest in a big way, even down to the talking animals. While Destiny of the Emperor does feel sort of superficially like Enix's game, the mechanics are a bit different. It's a bit similar to another RPG based on a classic Chinese novel, Satomi Hakenden, which we covered back in Crontendo 41, as well as a Tecmo game called Sonata Ju Yushin from episode 32. Just like those two games, you spend a great deal of time wandering around picking up extra playable characters. But here's the thing, uh, Destiny has like over a hundred recruitable characters. It's sort of like the Sui Koden of its time. In towns and in battles, you are always finding guys to recruit. This makes sense because Romance of the Three Kingdoms had around 2,000 different characters. Every other page, some new Chinese general just appears out of nowhere. Now it turns out this is not even adapted directly from the Three Kingdoms, instead it's from based on a somewhat obscure manga from Hiroshi Motomiya, which is so obscure it never even got an animated version. Most RPGs we've seen give you three or four member parties. Capcom ups the ante by giving you a whopping five spots in your party. Since this is a realistic RPG, instead of fighting monsters, you just fight regular guys. Often they'll be like a leader or a general or something who appears. You'll know these guys because they have a name instead of just like a generic description, Rebel Force. Destiny takes a couple elements as well from Ju Yushin, such as the notion that each character has its own miniature army with them. So what appear to be hit points are actually the number of troops each character commands. And the odd thing is you can just walk into an inn in town and restore your army to full strength, uh, which doesn't make any sense when you think about it. I mean, you're literally marching hundreds or thousands of guys into an inn, resting one night, and then all these dead soldiers come back to life. That makes less sense than most RPGs. Also, other than your five party members, there is a sixth position you need to fill, the Tactician. He doesn't actually fight in battles, but allows you to use tactics in battles, which is really just plain old magic. The tactics have Chinese names, but are mostly sort of like RPGs, magic spell type things. Various elemental attacks, healing, um, support spells, and so on. There are some interesting ideas implemented here. For example, water spells can only be used in the battle if it's taking place near a body of water. Another unusual feature is the all-out command, and that's basically just an auto-battle feature. It's convenient, but battles still last a pretty long time, and your party would just attack enemy units randomly. You cannot make it focus your attacks on one particular enemy at a time. So you usually take more damage doing it this way. The game starts with you trying to snuff out the Yellow Scarves Rebellion, or the Yellow Turban Rebellion as it's also called, which was a large uprising of commoners and unemployed soldiers who were tired of getting screwed by the wealthy landowners and the local government. From the perspective of the Romance of the Three Kingdoms, they were the bad guys because, I mean, come on, screw the common people. Also, some of the people in the rebellion were uh, apparently able to cure the plague that was going around China at that time, so they got a lot of followers because of that. After this, you take on all sorts of opposing military forces and will encounter many of the favorite characters, such as Lu Bu, the superhero-like warrior, or Zhuge Liang, the great military strategist employed by Liu Bei, 
of course, most of the guys you can recruit are worthless scrubs. And I don't even know why this game is called Destiny of the Emperor, since your character doesn't become the Emperor, at least not the real Emperor. He did rule over one of the three kingdoms that China was divided into. It was actually a guy from a rival kingdom that became the Emperor of Unified China and begat the Jin Dynasty. In a rather ahistorical twist, the game ends with battles against Sima Yi and the rest of his clan, though this isn't what happened in the novel or in real life. Rather than getting wiped out by Liu Bei, they were the ones who actually eventually conquered the other two kingdoms and started the Imperial Dynasty. Sima Yi even received a posthumous title of Emperor of China. The thing is, Three Kingdoms is a very long and complex novel, and the game can't really recreate the political intrigues found therein. Liu Bei himself has, was constantly changing fortunes, uh, often g gaining control of an area, then losing it, various alliances were forged, then broken, and the book is filled with scandals, rebellions, seductions, assassinations, sieges, betrayals, and quite a bit of weird stuff. One of the very strangest stories is when Liu Bei is on the run and has to take shelter in the hut of some peasant dude. The guy wants to show Liu Bei the proper hospitality, but he doesn't have any meat to serve him. So he goes into the back, slaughters his wife, cooks her up, and then serves it to the unsuspecting Liu Bei, who then finds the wife's carcass. Now, if this were an ancient Greek myth, this would lead to all sorts of bad shit going down. But here, uh, Bei cries tears of gratitude at the guy's generosity and thanks him. Which is a pretty odd reaction when you think about it. A lot of folks out there really love Destiny of the Emperor, and you will see it being called one of the best games on the Nintendo Entertainment System. I can't exactly agree with that assessment. For such an epic story with so many characters, there's very little plot or characterization. Instead, we get your classic JRPG structure of moving from town to town, occasionally fighting boss battles and picking up special items or something. And despite the 100 plus playable characters, there are no attempts made at giving anyone a personality at all. Each potential party member is just a collection of stats, a name, and a nice little portrait. Though many of the character portraits are really just the same guy with different facial hair and hats. If you like a lot of variety in your enemies, well, this game's not really for you. There's mostly just one type of enemy, the soldier. They are often accompanied by those named characters I mentioned who have you know, special abilities, but be prepared to fight quote-unquote rebel force over and over and over again. If you are looking for, like, a cool, distinctive-looking enemies or monsters, you better skip this game. Even the final battle is just a couple of generals and some rebel forces. The ending is pretty anticlimactic, even for an 8-bit RPG. Kill the bad guy, he says, well, I guess my time is up. Then you enter the castle and talk to the king, who says, thanks, now we can have peace in our land. Roll credits. It's not quite as bad as the classic congratulations ending, but it's not that far off either. Still, beneath the primitive-looking surface is a reasonably sophisticated game. It's certainly not as well-remembered as the more traditional fantasy RPGs of the 8-bit era, but it does have a pretty big cult following today, so I give it a hesitant recommendation. The first of two SNK games today is Baseball Star Mazase San Kano, or Baseball Star Eye on the Triple Crown. The Baseball Triple Crown is not the same as the horse racing one. Now we've seen a lot of lame, uninteresting baseball games, but this is not one of those. No, Baseball Star, or Baseball Stars as it was called in the US, is the Tecmo Bowl of NES baseball games. Now, over the years, we've seen console baseball games graduate from being relatively simple titles, like the original Nintendo published baseball, to the super complicated games we have today, where you control every aspect of the game, the leagues, the players, the teams. We've seen a few baseball games slowly introduce some simulation elements, but Baseball Stars really goes beyond what we've seen so far. You create leagues, and you can add teams to the leagues, each team has its own roster full of unique players with names, multiple stats, portrait art, etc. Naturally, you can create your own team, which involves naming the team, picking a logo, filling it up with players, 
Once you have your team or teams, you can trade players, hire players, ranging from rookies to stars. Naturally, this involves firing extraneous team members, which gives you this sad little scene. Aside from the expected stats like batting and running, players have prestige, meaning that having these guys on your team brings in more spectators to the games, which means more money for the team. Money allows you to improve the team by hiring better players and so on. Building up your team is essential, so really this does resemble a lot of modern sports games with career modes and owner's modes and so on. The game itself plays pretty good. SNK goes for a realistic style of art, as opposed to the silly looking cartoon figures from games like Family Stadium. You know, it's nice to play a baseball game where you can actually get a good hit on the ball, instead of endlessly hitting fouls. In terms of controls, I'd say this is definitely one of the better ones we've seen. Really the controls just work like pretty much every other single baseball game, but everything seems a little bit tighter. Of course, fielding is still tricky when you can't see your outfielders. All in all, I'd say it's the team creation and the extreme degree of customization that makes Baseball Stars such an outstanding baseball game. SNK would release a few sequels, and starting with Baseball Stars Professional, they move the series on to the Neo Geo. Holy crap! A Nintendo game! As I've mentioned, Nintendo is clearly devoting all their energies to creating games for the newly released Game Boy and the upcoming Super Famicom. But this one right here, Famicom Club Tante 2, is the first new Nintendo developed game we've seen since Super Mario Bros. 3, and that was back in October of last year. So that's seven months between games. Well, this is the second Famicom Club Tante game. Just like Nintendo's other FDS adventure games, it was released in two parts. The first came out on May 23rd, and the second on June 30th. So, what's going on here? This runaway kid is the main character from the first game. This is technically a prequel to the first game. The kid is being chased by the police, when this detective appears out of nowhere and basically says, I'll take this kid with me. So this chicken hawk detective decides to turn the kid into his ward, or whatever. Hey kid, do you like gladiator movies? This is a pretty classy game as far as Portopia clones go. It was produced by Gunpei Yokoi, uh, though Tosa also worked on this. So even Nintendo's using Tosa at this point. The music, like that of the first game, was from Kenji Yamamoto, who was later well, well, very well known as the primary composer for the Metroid games, starting with Super Metroid. The plot begins with the murder of a high school girl, and you are given the job of junior detective, and you're supposed to set out and investigate the murder. You know, the Nintendo FDS adventure games are pretty high quality, but there actually is a better version of this. In 1998, Nintendo released a Super Famicom remake. Obviously, this one offers better music and graphics, but it has another advantage. It's been given an English translation, unofficial of course. If you want to play one of these classic Nintendo adventure games, you might want to try it this way. Now on a positive note, um, the wait for the next Japanese Nintendo release will not be that long. There's a major title coming up at the end of July. Next up is one of the most infamous carts released for the NES, Tengen's Tetris. Released in June 1989, the sale was quickly halted by a court order, and all unsold copies were destroyed. What exactly happened? Well, we will take a look at the horrible convoluted history of Tetris, and the struggle over the rights to the game. 
Most of this information here is taken from David Sheff's book Game Over, for a couple reasons. The info is drawn from interviews with most of the parties involved, and having been published in 1993, these interviews were done shortly after this actually occurred, and before people's stories started changing due to fading memories and the need to rewrite history in a light a bit more favorable to them. Here are some of the characters we'll be encountering. Alexei Pajitnov, the main creator of Tetris. Nikolai Belikov, a Soviet bureaucrat. Robert Stein, from British software company Andromeda, and the guy who first discovered Tetris in the West. Robert Maxwell, British media magnate. Hank Rogers, of Bulletproof Software. Minoru Arakawa, and Howard Lincoln, from Nintendo of America and many others. This much we know for sure. Tetris was born in the former Soviet Union, at the computer center of the Academy of Sciences in Moscow, by a group of computer engineers. Chief among them was Pajitnov, who was inspired by the old mathematical game of Pentominoes. Tetris was originally developed for Soviet computers in 1985, but Pajitnov and his associates created a DOS version as well. Now, Tetris was not intended as a commercial product, so copies found their way around Eastern Europe quite freely. At this point, Robert Stein enters the picture. He was born in Hungary, but at the time was involved with licensing Hungarian software to British publishers through his own company Andromeda. In June 1986, he sees Tetris at a Hungarian computer institute in versions for DOS, the Apple, and the Commodore 64. Now, this being 1986, the only way Stein could get in touch with the Moscow Academy of Sciences was to send him a good old-fashioned telex. He thus sends a message saying he would like to acquire the rights for the game. The message is given to Pajitnov, and after going through the necessary bureaucracy, Pajitnov telexes back saying he would like to make a deal. Meanwhile, Stein is shopping Tetris to potential buyers in the UK. Now, here's where things get a little crazy. Stein asks Mirosoft, a well-known UK publisher, if they're interested. Mirosoft refers them to Spectrum Holobyte, a California-based software company partially owned by Mirosoft. Enter Gilman Louie of Spectrum Holobyte. We've encountered him before. His F-16 Fighting Falcon game was one of the first non-Sega-developed games for the Master System. We covered that way back in Cron Sega Episode 1. Also, the Master System Alpha Monopoly were connected to Gilman Louie's company Nexa. Louis played Tetris and decided it would be a huge hit and wanted the game. Thus, a deal was set up, giving the rights for Tetris to Mirosoft and Spectrum Holobyte, except for the handheld rights and the arcade rights. Mirosoft, and thus Spectrum Holobyte, were part of the media empire owned by Robert Maxwell, a former parliament member who owned such newspapers as the Daily Mirror, as well as book publishers, record labels, and half of MTV Europe, and God knows what else. A big shot, in other words. Now things start getting weird. In November 1986, Stein telexed what he thought was a deal to license Tetris to his company Andromeda, which would in turn license it to Mirosoft. He received a reply accepting the offer, or so he thought. In December 1986, Stein flew to Moscow to physically sign the contract with the Academy. However, when he got there, it turned out the deal was not as firm as he thought. And while it seemed the details were hammered out, no contract was signed at that meeting. This presented a problem, since Mirosoft and Spectrum Holobyte were already preparing for their release of Tetris. In June 1987, Stein officially completed the deal between his company and Mirosoft for the rights of uh, Tetris for all quote-unquote computer systems. The term computer system will be important later. Apparently, Mirosoft was not aware that Stein was still trying to get the rights to Tetris finalized with the Soviet Academy of Sciences. And then, more problems. Essentially, Pajitnov and the Academy had agreed to sell the Tetris rights to Stein, but a relatively new Soviet organization called Electron Org Technica, or ELORG for short, informed them that they did not have the authorization to negotiate the sale of Tetris, because only ELORG had that right. In other words, Stein's deal with the Academy of Sciences for Tetris was pretty much null and void. At this point, Stein was freaking out, since Mirosoft and Spectrum Holobyte were already selling computer versions of Tetris in January 1988. Stein then negotiated a deal with Elorg, which was officially signed in May 1988, giving Stein the right to Tetris for quote-unquote computers. Now this is when things start getting worse. Stein told Mirosoft that he was going to get the arcade rights to Tetris next. Thus, Mirosoft began negotiating with Artari Games, i.e. the parent company of Tengen, for the arcade rights. 
Atari then planned to release the arcade Tetris in the US and made a deal with Sega for the Japanese arcade rights. Meanwhile, Stein was going through a really torturous negotiation with Elorg, trying to get the contract for the arcade rights signed. So far, not too bad. But then a disagreement occurred between Spectrum Holobytes, Gilman Louie, and Mirrorsoft in the UK. You see, Hank Rogers of Bulletproof Software, who had released a few Famicom games, wanted the Japanese rights for home versions. However, Mirrorsoft had already sold the US and Japanese home rights to Atari games. So thus, Hank Rogers now had to contact Atari Games to get the Japanese home rights. Eventually, Rogers and Bulletproof Software released Tetris in Japan on both computers and the Famicom. We saw the Bulletproof Software version of Tetris in December 1988. We saw that version actually in Crontendo 40. Now at this point, Nintendo of America enters the picture. President Minoru Arakawa saw the computer Tetris at a game show, and thought it would be an ideal fit for the upcoming Game Boy, and asked Kink Rogers if he could obtain the rights for the handheld version. Rogers seemed to have an extraordinarily good relationship with Nintendo. In fact, Rogers seemed to be liked by just about anyone and everyone, and could talk anybody into anything. Meanwhile, Stein still couldn't seem to get the Soviets to seal the deal on the arcade rights. Mirosoft decided to go around Stein and try to get the rights themselves. Robert Maxwell's son, Kevin, was dispatched to Moscow. Amazingly, Rogers, Stein, and Kevin Maxwell all arrive in Moscow to meet with Elorg at the same time, in February 1989. To make matters more confusing, Stein's original contact at Elorg had been replaced, and the new guy, Nikolai Belikov, didn't seem that interested in working with him. Now, Rogers arrived first, charmed the Russians, made buddies with Pajitnov, and signed a contract with Elorg for the handheld rights. Then, the shit hit the fan. Rogers showed Belikov Bulletproof Software's Famicom Tetris game. Belikov stated this version was never authorized. Rogers gained the Soviets' trust by writing them a check for the royalties on the Famicom version. Meanwhile, Stein and Maxwell are in the same building in different rooms, and Belikov is meeting with them at the same time as Rogers. Belikov says he won't give Stein the arcade rights unless he signs a revised version of his original contract. The new contract contains an important extra line, defining computers as having, quote, a processor, monitor, disk drive, and keyboard. Stein, for some reason, fails to notice this line, and thus signs away his rights for Tetris on consoles. He then secured the arcade rights. Kevin Maxwell, meanwhile, got screwed, getting a contract saying he could bid for the handheld arcade and console Tetris rights later. Rogers told Nintendo of America that the rights for the console version of Tetris were now up for grabs. Nintendo quickly sent a lawyer over to Moscow to make a bid. According to Belikov, the rights were still open for what he was calling, quote-unquote, a computer without a keyboard. Belikov accepted the offer, and Arakawa and Howard Lincoln jetted to Moscow to sign the contract. Now once there, Lincoln was of course concerned that the Soviets were trying to sell them the rights that were already held by Mirosoft. So Belikov pulled out the revised contract, signed by Stein, and pointed out the line about the sale only applying to systems that had a monitor and keyboard. This convinced Lincoln that the console rights were still up for grabs, and thus Lincoln purchased those rights for an enormous amount of money. And Elorg faxed a letter to Mirosoft basically stating, Hey guys, you don't have the console rights to Tetris. Nintendo just purchased them. Suddenly, Mirosoft, Stein, and Atari Games were very, very upset. Now Atari, that is Tengen, had already created an NES version of Tetris and was getting ready to release it in the United States. Nintendo, feeling that they had the exclusive console rights, filed a cease and desist letter to stop Tengen from selling Tetris. Back in the UK, the rich and powerful Robert Maxwell was pretty upset and started stirring some shit up. He was actually friends with Gorbachev, who promised him he'd look into the whole Tetris deal. Suddenly, Belikov was getting pressure from the KGB. Tengen sued Nintendo, Nintendo countersued Tengen, and Atari stopped paying royalties to Mirosoft, who stopped paying Robert Stein. In June 1989, the legal proceedings were beginning right as Tengen was getting Tetris out on the shelves. Now, ultimately, what settled the matter legally was the line about monitors and keyboards. Tengen lost the case and could no longer sell its version of Tetris. Nintendo of America then released its own NES version of Tetris later in 1989. And really, this whole thing sort of dragged on for years. Stein, since no money was coming in from Mirosoft, couldn't pay Elorg and lost the computer and arcade rights. 
Robert Maxwell of Mirosoft drowned in 1991 and his empire collapsed. Tengen drowning in legal bills eventually folded. Nintendo and Hank Rogers made tons of money, and Pajitnov made none. So, what happened? Whose fault was all this? It's impossible to say. Some people blame Stein for essentially trying to steal the rights for the console Tetris. Stein states it was clear from the beginning that he was buying the rights for all existing formats of Tetris aside from the handheld rights and arcade rights. Stein partially blames Mirosoft, which sold the arcade rights to Atari before Stein had finalized the deal with Elorg, thus forcing him to do anything that Elor offered him in order for it to get the arcade rights. Ed Logg, the programmer of the Tengen Tetris, basically stated that Elorg sold the same Tetris rights to two separate companies. Those on the losing end of the deal tend to see Belikov as the chief bad guy. He knew that Mirosoft believed that they had purchased the console rights, but once realizing just how much money Nintendo was going to offer them, found a technical loophole to cheat Stein, Mirosoft, and Atari out of Tetris. Either way, it seems to me Stein was foolish to have signed that revised contract. Regardless of whose fault this really was, Tengen's Tetris barely saw the light of day before it was pulled from the shelves. Let's take a look at the actual game itself. So here's Tengen's Tetris, note the Academy Soft and Elorg copyrights. And on the select screen, licensed by Mirosoft, all the guys we were just talking about. And look at all the game options, single player, two player competitive, two player cooperative, both of which can be played with another person or with a CPU. And aside from choosing a level and a handicap, you can pick one of four musical tracks. So what can be said about Tetris? We all know this game. What made Tetris different than all the other puzzle games we've seen on the Famicom? Well, maybe it's the simplicity. Maybe it's the infinite replayability. Something like Solomon's Castle or Sokoban or The Adventures of Lolo are great games, but they are a bit more complicated with, you know, levels, enemies, items, rules to memorize. And they are sort of intended to stretch your brain's abilities. You might have to apply a certain, like, uh, level of logic, logical thought to these games. You have to look at the layout of the items and the screen and then concentrate to find a solution. And you can get stuck quite easily. In Tetris, there's really none of that. There's more or less one concept you have to keep in mind. Fill up all the spaces in a horizontal row. Once you learn how to rotate the blocks, that's pretty much about it. You know how to play the game. Anybody can play Tetris. It takes 20 seconds to learn. And you can never really get stuck. I mean, you can make mistakes, sure, but you can usually recover. And if not, then you start a new game. Everyone starts a new game eventually. And that's the thing. You can never really lose the Tetris. You just restart and continue. It doesn't really feel like failure. Here's the two-player mode. It's pretty simple. Compete for points. The blocks come down in the same order for both players. Later Tetris light games would often add in competitive features, like where clearing a row would cause more blocks to come down your opponent's side. But the competitive game here isn't really that developed. Both players work pretty much completely independently. I like this version of Tetris better than the earlier Famicom game from Bulletproof Software. And of course it's generally considered to be better than Nintendo's Tetris, which came out a few months later. As we see here, there's nothing too horrible about that version, but it just doesn't have all the different game selections and is missing a bit of flair of the Tengen Tetris. Supposedly, this sold very well for the few weeks that it was available, and would have been an enormous hit for Tengen had it not been pulled from the shelves. It's a real shame because I'd say this is unequivocally the best release we've seen from Tengen so far.
god, what is this? Another oddball Japanese game? Kaida Kida, Gunjin Shoki Nanya Sore. We all know what Shogi is, the Japanese chess game, but this is Gunjin Shogi, or Soldier Shogi. It might also be translated as Military Shogi. This was published by Sofell, which actually made a lot of computer games back then. As we can see, it's a shogi-style board game, but with a weird theme. Shogi, as you recall, is a Japanese board game very closely related to chess. The rules are similar to chess, but just a bit different. Gunjin Shogi, however, is something else entirely, as we'll see. Here are the five enemies you can play against. A sickle-wielding jack-o'-lantern guy, an alien, a sumo wrestler, a beret-wearing Adolf Hitler, and some sort of gangster wolf guy, I guess. It says here his name is Wolf Capole. Is that supposed to be a mangling of Wolf Capone, maybe? Now this is somewhere between real Shoki and a military simulation game. You and your opponent take turns moving your pieces, but instead of Shogi pieces you have various units which seem to be sort of scattered around randomly on the board. Each unit has its own attributes. For example, there's always a flying unit that has a lot of range. It's a duck here. Now doing the Crontendo series has exposed me to a lot of stuff I've never heard of before, and the military shogi genre is certainly one of them. And it does appear to be an actual genre. Electronic versions first appeared on Japanese computer games. Here, for example, is Gunjin Shogi Mars from Toshiba EMI on the MSX from 1985. Or here's another one, Gunjin Shogi Military Chess from Pack and Video, a 1988 MSX2 game. And as far as I can tell, it actually began as an actual physical board game played with Shogi pieces. Like a lot of military simulation games, Gunjin Shogi employs a system where certain units are strong against some units, but weak against others. So if Unit A is strong against Unit B, then Unit A will always defeat B when they occupy the same space. But you can't see what the other player's units are. In the video game versions, you can see what units you have, but not the CPUs. They all just appear as generic soldiers on the board. You need to determine what the pieces are by their moves and the outcome of the battles. When playing in real life on a physical board, this is done by placing your shogi pieces face down. So as you can imagine, it's a pretty difficult game. So it appears that we've learned something about a somewhat obscure Japanese board game today. Let it never be said that Crontendo is not educational. Alright, it's our good buddy's Culture Brain, back with a new game. Whoa, that's pretty freaky. Super Chinese 2, Dragon Kid. Now this is a pretty weird game. On the title screen there are two options. We'll check out the second one first. It is, rather mysteriously, a track and field type game that just sort of seems tacked on. There is a connection to the main game, as we'll see later, but the inclusion of this seems just a little strange. I guess they wanted a two-player competitive component or something. Let's shift gears a bit and look at the US version called Little Ninja Brothers. A name that doesn't make sense because ninjas are Japanese, not Chinese, but whatever. The artwork has been redrawn here, not sure why. Here's the main game, the RPG game, which had a two-player mode, quite odd for an RPG of this vintage. It actually has a pretty good intro. So the Emperor of Chinaland has been kidnapped, and Jack and Ryu set out to rescue him. This is one of those wacky Japanese games which takes oddball elements like TV sets and tosses them into a fantasy world Chinese setting. As we'll see, there's all kinds of weird talking animals and stuff in here. It's actually quite creative. Private Stash. I'm pretty sure I know what that refers to usually, and it's not like a bunch of money that you're hiding somewhere. 
Super Chinese 2 is an RPG with the typical Dragon Quest style overworld, villages, and to a lesser extent, dungeons. This is the first village, it's located right next door to the starting point. Anyone who's played Dragon Quest or similar games will know exactly what to do here. You talk to NPCs, check out the shops, get equipped, and head on out. The original Super Chinese was an arcade port released for the Famicom in 1986, only about a month after the first Dragon Quest game. It was called Kung Fu Heroes in the US. It was a straightforward single-screen action game in which you walked around punching dudes and rocks with your big ol' fist. The sequel essentially takes the mechanic of the first game and uses it as the basis for the battles. So whenever you get a random encounter, instead of turn-based battles, you do this. Other than that, Little Ninja Brothers is almost exactly like every other RPG you've played. Here's my equipment. This is my status. Though beyond these, there must also be some sort of defense stat, which is not displayed because you buy armor to increase it. Alright, now remember on the menu you had like those racing games you could do? Those are integrated into the main game. From time to time you'll need to play one of those in order to get a special ability or something. Here you have to pop balloons to learn a special kicking move. Couple things here. The random battle frequency can be very irritating. At times you can be looking for battles to gain experience and you can walk around for like a minute with nothing at all. And then sometimes a battle will start every other step. There are two things to do in battles. Punch rocks to get special items and kill enemies. You have two basic attacks, a punch and a jump. These blue guys cannot be killed by the punches, so you need to jump and land on them. Or, I guess, sort of jump over them and land near them. It's actually not quite clear what counts as a hit when it comes to jumping. After you've killed enough, uh, the rest will run off and you'll get some experience and money. Another irritating thing are very unbalanced encounters. I'm at level 2 here, and suddenly along comes a group of level 10 enemies, completely out of nowhere. And after this might be a whole bunch of level 1 and 2 monsters. These bull things are pretty much impossible to kill, at least at level 2, and they can very quickly annihilate you. And the game does this all the time. I was actually having trouble making progress at times because I kept running into groups of enemies with like 10 levels or so above mine. On the positive side, Little Ninja Brothers has some really great character art and a very unusual and creative sense of humor. The village Delicious is being starved to death by the food hoarding king. The citizens are all walking around half starved. When you enter the palace of the king, he seems very generous and friendly and gives you a huge meal. This is actually a pretty well done plot twist for a 1989 RPG. And in a rather gruesome touch, you are locked up with prisoners who are being fattened up by the king who is apparently an aficionado of human flesh. You can escape, attain, obtain a helpful item, and then return to the palace and engage in the first boss fight. Now the boss fights here are a little bit different than most RPGs. Um, they consist of like several rooms full of consecutively more difficult enemies, and then finally the boss himself, which is you know fought like in an action-style battle. Fighting this guy is not too exciting, um, but the whole idea of being like drugged, imprisoned, escaping, and then engaging the boss and his minions is actually a bit more involved than most RPG boss battles at this time. This kind of heavily plotted boss battle is more something that you associate with Super NES RPGs. And then in a funny epilogue, the real king rewards you with a huge meal which makes you too fat to get through the door, and you need to exercise to work off the weight. Now aside from your standard uh, punch and jump attacks, hitting the rocks on the battle screen will drop various other attack options. You can see these along the bar at the top of the screen. The Ks will allow you to perform a jumping kick, which is kind of hard to actually hit anything with. The little star things are projectiles, and finding enough of the M's in one battle will give you temporary invincibility. You can also uh, pick up swords that perform powerful attacks but have a downside. Namely, that enemies killed by swords don't drop experience. These things give a bit of variety to the combat, but the punches and jumps are pretty much your bread and butter attacks. This town is called Silly City, and everyone is, well, mentally disabled. For some reason, there are a lot of shirts hanging to dry outside. 
I'm not sure if that's somehow linked to mental incapacity in Japan or not. And, oh yes, the shops are being run by these Dr. Susie-looking snakes. And this is odd, there's uh, three little naked dudes. I didn't finish this game, but there is a password that allows you to see the ending. It's quite charming. Just like Culture Brain's uh, Magic of Scheherazade, Little Ninja Brothers is an unusual hybrid with very well-developed characters and a really strong translation. At this time, even high-end games like Dragon Quest III rarely had characters that sort of, you know, gave out more than a line or two of dialogue. But Culture Brain made, like, every person in the game seem quirky and memorable. And the character portrait art is all very good as well. I suppose the one weak spot is the battles. After playing something like River City Ransom, the controls and mechanics seem so clunky and not really very much improved from the first game. And certain things like having random groups of high-level enemies appear out of nowhere to kill you and not being able to run away all, all of the time are pretty annoying. I'll go ahead and leave you with this goofy ending. We just had one of those inexplicable gaps in the Famicom release schedule. Super Chinese 2 came out on May 26th, and then nothing for a whole month. Can you imagine there not being like a single Xbox 360 game released for a month nowadays? I don't think that ever happens. Well, here we are on June 23rd, and the utterly insane looking LaSalle Ishii No Child's Quest comes out. I'm gonna have to give this the Crontendo Wacky Japanese Game designation. Do you remember that adventure game based around the roller skating boy band, Hikari Genji Roller Panic? Well, this is an RPG based on a pop band, but not a real-life pop band as far as I know, but a fictional one. However, this is another celebrity-based game. LaSalle Ishii is a Japanese media personality. For some reason, in Roman characters, his name is often written as Lhasa R. Ishii, and you often see this game listed under that spelling. So here's your band. They don't look too excited. And is that kid in the middle wearing suspenders? Is he going for the clockwork orange look or something? Now, I don't know who developed this, but this game does clearly not push the Famicom to its technological limits. And it's very clearly patterned after Dragon Quest, though this takes place in the real world. If you're watching this in the 60 frames per second version, you'll notice that crazy sprite flicker there. Instead of purchasing weapons and armor, you buy outfits and musical equipment. There are some weird things about this game. First of all, despite your band having three members, you function as only one party member. That is, you only have one set of stats, and you only attack once during your turn in battles. And you are not technically attacking the people that you meet here, like, uh, for example, Skrillex, but instead you are trying to convince them to like your band or something. You just keep trying to withstand their attacks, and the battle will eventually end. Sort of a shame, because the game might be better if you were actually a teen pop band that went around killing random people and cops on the streets. Also, in the upper right, there is a dissatisfaction category. One of them is Reen, or Cold. These seem to measure your physical discomfort. So, yeah, this is a pretty oddball game, but it's not too surprising, considering we've already seen several games based on TV personalities and J-pop bands. Our other FTS game today is from Jalico, Big Challenge Go Go Bowling, the fourth and last game in Jalico's Big Challenge series. The previous games were a judo game, a shoot 'em up, a side scrolling western themed run and gun, and now a bowling game. 
Why did Jellico lump all these together into the same series? I don't know, I guess they were all just cheapy FDS games. By the way, this will be the last Famicom Disk System game from Jellico. And this douchebag here is your opponent! Look at that headband! Though your player is represented by some anonymous looking schmuck with no chin. I guess at its heart is sort of like a simplified golf game. You position your aim, you can move the ball left or right, and you can also sort of control the direction via those bars on the middle right of the screen. Then you do the old power meter thing, and that's pretty much about it. However, the power meter is very fussy, more so than in most golf games. You have to land it right at the blue arrow, otherwise your ball will be way off center. Even being one bar off can cause you to miss the pins entirely. And if you get a gutter ball, the game displays this little illustration. Gata, it says. I believe this is the second bowling game we've seen, the other being Dynamite Bowl from a couple years ago. And while Go Go Bowling is reasonably competent, it is pretty generic. Hey kids, do you like robots? Do you like your robots deformed? How about super deformed? Well, then I have a game for you. SD Gundam Gachapon Senshi 2. The first game was covered back in Crontendo 27. It was an FDS release, and then there was also a map collection earlier in 1989. But this is the true sequel to SD Gundam Gachapon Senshi. The map collection was more like an expansion pack of some sort. Alright, so you choose your options. Two player, one player versus computer, and so on. I don't really know why that guy looks like Edvard Munch's The Scream. There's also a built-in cheat function, or maybe it's a handicap function. I'll give myself a huge advantage because I don't really want to spend too much time playing this thing. As you can see, I have the advantage in forces, as well as more money for building units. See that thing with the G on the front? That's your gachapon machine. That'll allow you to spend the money and build robots, just like any modern day strategy type game. Uh, this was developed by Human, incidentally, just like the first game. The concept here is these are capsule toys, sold in those vending machines where you put a coin and out pops a capsule with a Gundam toy inside. Gachapon is what Bandai calls its toy machines. Gacha is supposed to sound like the noise made when the handle is turned. The thing is, this seems very similar to the first game. It's almost identical. Some of the background tiles have been changed, and there's a bit more animation. The units are actually very similar to the ones in the original. The uh, user interface has been tinkered with a bit. The biggest improvement is that since this is on a cartridge, rather than the FDS discs, it's faster. You no longer have to deal with all those loading screens. But really, there doesn't appear to be that much difference between this and the first game. It's still a pretty annoying game. This is mostly because of the battles. In most military simulation games, when your forces meet the enemies, there's like a little short animation representing the battle and then the results are displayed. Famicom Wars, Military Madness, Civilization, they all use this system. The SD Gundam games, however, actually have you fight it out in battles with these little robot versus robot sections. You actually need to run around fighting each other until one runs out of health. While there's nothing wrong with uh, deviating from the time-tested standard of automatic battles, I mean, quite a few of the military simulation games we've seen in content have done this, the problem here is that these segments are really dorky. The robots feel very clumsy and mostly just end up like standing next to the other guy hitting your attack button over and over again until the weaker robot blows up. If you try to play tactically, like hiding behind buildings and then firing off shots or something, the battles will drag out way too long and the levels in this game are already too long. This is the first level in the game. Remember Military Madness? You could win the first level in a matter of minutes. Here, despite the fact that I gave myself a huge advantage from the get-go, I actually gave up because it was taking so damn long. 
How is this? Well, because it takes so long to move your units across the damn screen. You have to move about 31 spaces to get your, um, from your gachapon machine to the enemies. And all the units move very slowly over sea, desert, and forest squares, which make up a huge chunk of the distance. Units tend to move like around one or two squares per turn when going over these kind of tiles. In order to win level, you must defeat the super powerful Gundam inside the enemy's gachapon. And by this point, I could have defeated him, but all the units I created in the second half of the game were still slowly making their way across the map. Combine this with the fact that the, there's like these long battles, and you get a game that this drags on way too long. Well, anyway, there's plenty more SD Gundam games coming up later in Crontendo, so maybe these next ones will be better. Now this is an interesting one. Quinty, published by Namco, is a very well made and enjoyable action puzzle game. Just like Tetris, the mechanics behind the game are quite original. It's not just another Sokoban inspired game or something. You can choose any of the nine stages except the final castle stage. We've gone ahead and started the easiest one. Your hero is named Carton for some reason. Maybe that's supposed to be Cartoon. Your girlfriend has been kidnapped, naturally and the objective is simply to destroy all enemies, but your secondary goal is to pick up stars and to rack up points. Each space on the floor is a flippable tile. Flipping one adjacent to an enemy will push them backwards. Doing this to push them back into a wall will destroy the enemy. Most levels contain various special tiles, such as uh, like those you see in the corner there. Touching these, for example, will flip over every tile in the corresponding row and column which will push back any enemies it hits and crush them into the wall. Keep in mind this will also flip over any star tiles, making it so you can't collect those stars unless you reflip them. Collecting stars gives you extra lives, so for goodness sake, grab those stars. Surprisingly, Quinty did get a US release, but remember, Namco did not publish games for the NES in the United States. Instead, it was released by Hudson, who changed the name to Mendel's Palace. Why was it called Mendel's Palace? No idea. It now has this creepy looking bunch of guys on the title screen. Likewise on the uh, box cover, the cartoony figures have been replaced by this uh, collection of freaks and weirdos. Mendel, of course, was the 19th century friar who laid the groundwork for the modern study of genetics. Maybe all the bad guys in this game are supposed to be genetically screwed up mutants or something? I don't know. A few things were changed in the US version, but really it's the same game. The plot, according to the US manual, is completely new. In sort of like a Nightmare on Elm Street inspired twist, the heroine has been uh, trapped in her dream by her own toys and dolls. Yet the manual artwork doesn't depict them as looking anything like dolls, so Mendel Palace is not very consistent with its own backstory. Anyway, perhaps the primary reason the game is so notable is that it is the first game from developer Game Freak, Satoshi Tajiri's company with art by Ken Sugimori. Game Freak would eventually become a Nintendo second party developer, and whose greatest success was, of course, Pokemon. If you've ever wondered why they call themselves Game Freak, well, Tajiri and Sugimori originally started out publishing a gaming fanzine called Game Freak before deciding to make games themselves. So Quinty is a pretty darn good game. Each level introduces a new type of enemy, which will have new behaviors and abilities. Aside from revealing stars, flipping tiles will often reveal special tiles. Here, for example, the moon will turn the level dark and bring out the stars on every tile. Later, you can get bad tiles, such as portals that produce more enemies. After beating each level on a particular stage, you fight a boss battle. With the exception of the first stage, it just gives you this cutscene. You then move on to the next stage. Though like I said, you can start on any stage you want except the final one, so it's sort of like Mega Man in a way. Enemies get tougher as the game goes on. These guys jump and can't be pushed back while they're in mid-jump. 
Later enemies will have the ability to flip tiles themselves, freeze tiles so they can't be flipped, and so on. It can get very hectic in the later stages. The two-player co-op game is even better, though be warned you can push the other player into enemies if you're not careful. Overall, it's a pretty darn fine game, one of the better puzzle games on the Famicom, and certainly a worthy start for Game Freak. Here we are on the last day of June 1989, and it's another SNK game published by K Amusement. Datsu Goku, or Prison Break. Like so many other SNK developed games, it received a US release, this time under the name POW, Prisoners of War, a helpful name for those who didn't know what POW stood for. We even have a little opening cutscene. Alright, so your orders are to infiltrate enemy headquarters as prisoners of war. So the headquarters is located at a POW camp? Is that a normal thing to do in the military? I thought POW camps were always someplace out of the way and far from the front lines. Whereas uh, the headquarters might have to be somewhat mobile as the front line moves around. I don't know. Conveniently, you are captured, sent to headquarters where you blow up the cell. How? Where do you get the explosives? Uh, I don't know. Now you can take down enemy forces by punching every single enemy soldier to death. So POW is a beat-em-up. You have a punch, a kick, and a hard-to-use jumping kick. Look at this. It's being worthless here. So clearly POW is very Double Dragon-like. And just like Double Dragon, it started out in the arcades, in this case in 1988. Almost all of SNK's NES releases at this time were arcade ports. You get a much better Cell Escape sequence here. One of the most striking things about the game was the hilariously powerful kicks that you have. Dudes just go flying across the room when you kick them. Also very cool was picking up military assault rifles. And the arcade game did the standard two-player co-op as well. For the home version, this was dropped, just like with Double Dragon. So here we have the assault rifle. You can pistol whip or rifle whip enemies with it by hitting the punch button, the kick button will fire the rifle. Naturally this just tears through enemy soldiers, but it also burns through ammo really quick. You rarely get the rifle because, quite frankly, it would make the game too easy if it were easily obtainable. Other dropped weapons include a throwing knife, and uh, well, actually, that's all I found. You will occasionally enter these rooms where you have to fight a few enemy soldiers, and it'll give you some kind of like special items like uh, armor, brass knuckles for more damaging punches, health refills, that kind of thing. However, you will lose this stuff when you die. Now hopefully you saved the rifle for the first boss. It's a big ol' helicopter, a typical Rambo-inspired boss. Basically, you can just wait till it gets low enough and then shoot it up. If you don't have the rifle, you have to throw grenades at it. One thing about POW is that it's hard. At least it's hard for someone who's never played it before, like me. There's a Konami-like cheat code that gives you 20 lives, but it's really easy to burn through those lives, I mean, amazingly fast. In my opinion, this is much more difficult than Konami's Contra. You have a health bar, but getting hit by a grenade will instantly cause you to lose one life. The levels are relatively long with plenty of enemy encounters, and making an occasional mistake will be enough to whittle down your lives at a pretty decent clip. Now granted, I've never played this game until now, but it does seem a lot harder even than stuff like Double Dragon or Bayou Billy. I mean, it was at least tolerable until I got to this boss. Now aside from being able to shoot you from clear across the room, he drops a steady stream of grenades on you. Each shot and grenade will cause you to lose one life, and if you get knocked down by a grenade, he'll often walk by and drop another grenade on you while you're still on the ground, and then keep repeating this until all your lives are gone. And less frequently, if his spread guns hit you and knocks you back, to immediately fire again, hitting you a second time. So you can easily lose all your lives in a matter of seconds with this guy. And he moves way faster than you. This is one of the cheapest bosses I've seen on Crontendo so far. I mean, there's gotta be a trick to beating this guy, but I don't know what. 
Anyway, uh, aside from that, I suppose that POW is a pretty cool-looking beat-em-up that doesn't always play fairly. This music seems ripped off sort of from uh, Goblin score to Deep Red. Our last game today is Murder Club, sometimes called Satsujin Club or JB Herald Murder Club. Hmm, what? I see the programmers got very clever here. This is from Seta, who publishes mostly crap at this point, like the Tom Sawyer game, though the game today was created by River Hill Soft. As odd as it seems, Murder Club was more or less River Hill Soft's claim to fame. It has a pretty slick interface. There's even a map which shows you the locations that you can move around in. It relies a lot less on long dialogue sequences, uh, the way a lot of other similar games do, like Toachiki Sherlock Holmes. It somehow feels a bit more detective-y. Apparently the original game was designed by one Rika Suzuki and she's still active today, making games like Hotel Dusk, Room 251, and Trace Memory. Murder Club has appeared in many forms, but it began on Japanese computers. This is the MSX version, from 1988 supposedly, though other sources say it was released in 1986. The title screen calls it Final Mystery Murder Club. This is sort of the ease of Portopia-style adventure games. It came out on multiple platforms, and the graphics and even the title were changed each time. It got a DOS version a couple years later. This even came out in the US. Everything moves much faster than in most Japanese adventure games, where traditionally the text appears very slowly, letter by letter. This seems to have received pretty good reviews from US gaming publications. In 1998, a TurboGrafx CD version was released. The artwork was once again completely redone, there was new music, and once again it was released in the United States. The title was changed to J.B. Herald Murder Club, the name of the detective in the game. The name stuck and all the sequels were released under the J.B. Herald name. There have been games for the DS, cell phones, that sort of thing. And well, sorry folks, but I'm going to have to pull the same stunt I did with Ease and say let's check out the Turbo City version when we reach Cron Turbo. So keep Murder Club in the back of your mind, and we'll come back to it then. There we go. We're not actually quite done with June yet. We have some US releases from June 89 that we'll cover next time. So let's do our episode roundup. Best game, I'd say Tetris. Maybe that's not fair, since Tetris has already been released many times by the time Tengen put it out for the NES but I'd say that this is the best version of Tetris for this console, so they will get the gold medal. If you feel that Tetris should have been disqualified for some reason, then I'll say Baseball Stars if you're a sports game fan, and uh, Destiny of an Emperor if you like RPGs. I was tempted to say Little Ninja Brothers, but honestly I'd say the combat holds that game back. As for the worst, I don't know, stuff like Kabushiki Dojo and Gogo -Go Bowling are sort of lame and boring, but it's not like they're terribly made. Instead of worst game, I'll go with the most disappointing game and choose Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. It's not awful, but Konami could have done better and certainly would do better in the future. Episode 45 will take us into July 1989. We'll be seeing more baseball games, a classic weirdo game from Bandai, a nice action-adventure game from Capcom, and a certain title that involves you rescuing the president from ninjas. See you then.
And just in case anyone still has any lingering doubts about what a truly magical place the late 80s and early 90s were, I will once again present this to you. Go ninja, go ninja, go! Go ninja, go ninja, go! Go ninja, go ninja, go! Go, 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 go!